Um, so we're super excited to have you all here and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mel Bilko and I am the head of community engagement here at Kila. Um, we also have Samantha Lego, who is our director of marketing on the back end of things today. Um, you might see her, you know, pop in the chat box there or answering some of your technical questions. Um, her and I have been running all of our webinar series that you may have seen lately, such as plugged in and adaptation. And throughout this summer, uh, we're trying to do at least two or three webinars per month. And actually this month, we've chosen to focus our topic specifically on social media. Um, in the summer, we know that there can be such a lull with engagement. So we really thought this would be the perfect time to have these webinars to help you kind of, you know, experiment and try new things in, you know, a more dead kind of time right now. So um, that's also why we've invited Adam Walker here today with us. Um, he is an expert at social media, so we're super excited to have him. Uh, but before I do introduce Adam, I just wanted to remind everyone about a couple of things. Um, so the first is that this session will be about an hour in length, so that includes about a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session at the end. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box. Um, I know that we're all pretty much Zoom experts at this point, but just please make sure that if you do type in the chat box that you make sure that it's to all uh, panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your question. Um, also, I just wanted to let you know that this session will be recorded. So if you miss anything, don't worry, we'll be sending you the recording along with the slide deck, um, hopefully by the end of the day, today, if not for sure by the end of this week. Um, and also, I'd just like to mention that by attending this webinar, you're eligible to receive one CFRE credit. So if you have any questions or would like to receive a credit, uh, please reach out to me. My email is melissa.bilco at kila.com and we'll pop that in the chat box in a bit here. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our speaker today. We have Adam Walker joining us. Adam is the co-founder of 48 and 48 and the CMO at TechBridge. Um, the title of his session today is How Not to Waste Time on Social Media as a Nonprofit. Thank you so much, Adam. I will pass it off to you now. We're super excited to have you here. Thanks, Mel. So good to be here. So nice to, to see you and, and get to participate with everyone. So I'll uh, just share my screen here in just a second. And then we'll get started. I think you, you got to stop sharing your screen first. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everyone. So we're going to talk about how to not waste time on social media. It's really easy to get lost in social media and to waste a lot of time there. And so what I wanna do is really start with a very high level overview of how to think about social media, uh, ways to begin making plans for your social media approach. And then really what I wanna do is, is actually have maybe a bit more than, than 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A so that I can hopefully answer quite a few questions on the fly and, and really help you specifically with what your needs are at this particular time. So um, a couple of things as we go ahead and get started, um, I'll just share just a little bit about me. Uh, yes, I do always wear the fedora. It's kind of the brand. Got to stick with the brand and it's easier than a cool haircut. So um, I really like that. I can pay for a hat one time and wear it, you know, a lot. I don't have to keep paying for haircuts, which is sort of great. Um, this is me. This is the family. I always start with husband, father of six, wear of fedoras. Um, I, I have founded a, a great nonprofit, 48 and 48. I'll talk about in a minute. I'm CMO at TechBridge, which is another great nonprofit I'll talk about in a minute. Um, father to five and about to be adding our sixth child via adoption from China. Um, we're excited. We're going to actually get to uh, get to talk to him at some point next week for the first time. So uh, lots of good things happening. Also, I've got a website. I've got podcasts. I host a podcast about technology. I host a podcast uh, for Susan G. Komen about breast cancer and other things. So please check out my website if you want to take a look. A couple of, of other just little brief things. If you want to take a look, happy to show you this. Um, so I do have a nonprofit marketing newsletter I wanted to mention just because you're on this call about nonprofit marketing. So I thought it might help to mention that. No pressure. If you want to check it out, feel free. Um, 48 and 48 is my nonprofit I co-founded where we do uh, free websites for nonprofits. Um, so you can sign up there and you can sign up to be a part of our next event and get a free website created for you. 
and TechBridge is a uh, technology nonprofit that helps other nonprofits with their technology. If you have any questions about any of those, happy to answer them later on, but just wanted to throw that out there as we get started. So let's start talking about social media. Uh, we have to start with mindset because there's a lot of things that will come to mind when you say the word social media. Um, so I guess really that's where I want to start which is to ask you if you can, if you can put in the chat, what comes to mind, what comes to your mind when we say social media? So just go ahead and, and populate in the chat, uh, just any phrases or anything else that comes to mind. Facebook, okay? Facebook, Facebook and Instagram. Man, Facebook's got a lot of fans here. Community, LinkedIn, all right, anybody else? Twitter, sharing, Snapchat. Oh, we got a Snapchatter in the house, okay. Broadband is a, bro a broadcast medium, okay. Instagram, great. TikTok. Oh, we can talk about TikTok later on for sure. Uh, oops, didn't mean to keep clicking there. My bad. Communication. Great. YouTube. Brand visibility. Oh, that's a good one. Okay. So a lot of things come to mind with social media, right? And, and as it should, uh, there's a lot of complexity to social media. And what I want to do is sort of take all that out, take out all the fluff, take out all the white noise and talk about at the core, what is social media and how can we approach it to make it the most effective for our nonprofits. So let's start by changing our mindsets and let's consider how we think about social media. So social media is, and these are some of the things that you did mention in your chat. Um, it is a community. It is about relationships. It is a conversation. And that's really the starting point that we should always have when we come to social media. It's an opportunity to interact. It's an opportunity to join in. It's an opportunity to be a part of something larger than ourselves. Uh, social media is not, not a marketing channel. We, we talk about it as a channel. I am guilty of talking about it as a channel. And while that, that can be an accurate description, in some ways it's so much bigger than a marketing channel and it can become dangerous when we start to talk about it just that way. Um, it's not a one-sided conversation. We, it's really easy in social media to jump out there and broadcast, 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 um, push, 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 push. Here's, is all about me. And it's tempting to do that because people, you know, we think people follow our nonprofits because they love our nonprofits. And while that is true, they, they do love our nonprofits. A lot of the times they're following us on social. They're following the nonprofit accounts, not so much because they specifically love the nonprofits, but they might love other aspects. They might be following for other reasons that are beneficial to them. And so it's not a one-sided conversation and it's not just a place to get. So if you go in thinking, oh, I'm gonna leverage social media and I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna get this and I'm gonna get this. It's probably not an approach that's gonna work well for you. Um, it is a place to give 80% and get 20%. And so if you, if you write down nothing, if you listen to nothing else I say, that's the, the, that's, those are the numbers to remember, right? On social media, you want to be giving 80% of your time. You wanna be asking or getting 20% of your time. And here's what I mean by that. So your accounts, the accounts that people follow, your, your Facebook, your Instagram, your Snapchat, your YouTube channel, people are following because they gain something from that channel. So what do they gain? Well, we'll talk about what they gain in a minute, but the, the, the reality is you have to give them what they're looking for and they have to feel like they've gained something by following you. And then 20% of the time, you can ask, you can say, hey, we've got this initiative coming up. We have this volunteer opportunity. We have this, this donation opportunity. And you can ask for 20% of the time. The problem is most nonprofits flip these numbers and they're asking 80% of the time and they're giving 20% of the time. And so we have to get back to a healthy balance where we're really giving away good information. We're giving away good content. We're giving away interesting and helpful things to our audience. And then we're asking 20% of the time. So next we got to look at what our plan is. So uh, that's really kind of the crux of it, really. I mean, if you think about it, uh, a, a lot of, we want to be good on social media. So we'll sort of dive in, but you can't really dive in without a plan. And I think social media is one of the places and one of the few places where people tend to dive in without a plan at all and just think, oh, it's just magically going to work, but it, it doesn't. And then you get frustrated and then you spend more time and then it's frustrating even more. And so we've got to have a plan uh, and let's talk about how to create that. So these are, to me, are some of the core questions you've got to start with. Um, you've got to start with research. And it's tempting to think that we already know everything that there is to know. It's tempting to think, oh, I understand the platform. I understand the people. I understand the audience. So 
you've got to start with a fresh perspective and be willing to step back and say, okay, I'm going to look at this with fresh eyes. And I'm going to recognize that I probably don't know as much as I think I do. And then you've got to ask these questions. So why are you doing this? What outcomes do you want from digging more deeply into social media? What outcome will most dramatically affect your nonprofit? So what's it going to take? Is, is gaining 5,000 more followers on Twitter going to help your nonprofit? Or is it gaining more subscribers on YouTube? Or is it gaining more interactions and engagements on Facebook? Like what, what's going to matter? Why are you doing it? And then next, what audience do you need to connect with in order to reach those outcomes? So for example, if you're thinking, oh, I need to use social media so that we can connect to more donors, then you've got to look at what audience are typically donors. Um, are they recent college graduates or are they established workforce people? You know, are they uh, families or are they individuals? Like, like who are they and, and, and how, why do you want to connect with those people and how's that going to affect your overall outcome that you're looking for? If you're looking for volunteers, what audience do you need to connect with to have volunteers, right? And next, where does that audience spend their time online? So it's easy to say, to, to choose a platform based on what you're comfortable with. So I'm comfortable with Facebook. I'm comfortable with Instagram. So it's really easy for me to go, oh yeah, we're going to use Facebook and Instagram. We don't need to worry about Snapchat. We don't really need to worry about YouTube. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. We're not worried about that. But is that really correct for my audience, right? Is that where my audience spends the most time? And so you've got to start looking at the demographics. You've got to look at the age profiles. You've got to look at just all of the, the communities that you're involved in and figure out where are they spending their time online and, and, and how can you begin to engage there? Uh, next, what does that audience care about that you can connect with them over? So I think, you know, we've all had that experience at a family reunion where there's this cousin that you just love dearly but there's just nothing that you have in common with them. I mean, just very few things you have in common with them. And then, you know, you're, you're, you do the best you can to have that sort of small talk. And then suddenly, somehow, you stumble across this topic that you both love. And maybe it's a movie or maybe it's a sport or something like that. I don't know. But, but then the conversation just blooms and opens up. And now you can talk about a hundred different things that are a subcontext of that particular topic. And so you've got to figure out with your audience, like what, what does your audience really care deeply about? And a lot of times it might not be the broad specific mission of your organization. It really might be one of those smaller nuanced threads that runs through your organization. And then you can start talking about that thread and then the conversation opens up and the engagement opens up and you can really get a lot of people deeply engaged and passionate about your organization. And so you've got to really dig and research and understand to find that out and find out what those threads are that connect your audience. And then last, how does your audience like to consume content? So again, you know, don't go with what your preferences are. Don't, don't, don't assume based on what your skill sets are, but, but find out, ask your audience, like, what do they want? Do they want videos? Do they want photos? Do they want white papers? Do they want poems? I had to throw poems in there. It just felt right. Um, you know, and have you asked them? And so that, and really that, that kind of is the crux of this whole thing is ask, like take the time and ask your followers what they want. So I would, I would recommend just a couple of steps on this and I don't have a slide on this, so I'm just gonna riff for just a moment. And if you'd like to take notes, feel free, but, um, but ask your followers. So start by asking on the platforms that you think you're gonna use. Hey, what do you wanna see more of from us? Do a poll, do a Twitter poll, do a Facebook poll. Ask what they wanna see more of. That's, that's one way to do it. Send out an email survey. If you have an email list, send out a survey. Hey, where are you spending your time online? Where do you want to engage with us? What kind of messages do you want to hear from us? What kind of content do you want to receive from us? What's helpful to you? What do you really care about? What makes you engage? I mean, create a, create a Google Forms survey. It's free. Create a Google Forms survey, send it out in your next newsletter and do some research. And then not only that, but schedule some phone calls with some great examples of your target audience and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Let me have a 15 minute conversation. Where do you spend your time online? Who do you follow? that's interesting. Why do you find that interesting? What, are there any nonprofits that you follow that are doing a great job that we can learn from? But until we're willing to really dig in and ask these questions of our followers, we're not really going to truly understand them at a deep enough level to then really connect with them 
in a meaningful way and be able to expand on how we're reaching them and how we're interacting with them on social. So I would strongly recommend take some time, do some research, never assume that you know your audience as well as you think you, you don't. You don't know your audience as well as you think you do. None of us do. So take some time, do some research. It's never going to hurt you to do that. Next, choose a channel. Don't do everything. Choose one channel that you can do well and spend all of your social media time there. This is big. Don't just download TikTok to download TikTok. If you want to get on TikTok, that's fine. Own it. Like be the nonprofit that is dominating TikTok. If you want to be on Snapchat, be the nonprofit that is dominating Snapchat. But don't try to do it all. Don't try to do Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube channel, TikTok, Snapchat. It's just, it's going to kill you. You can't do it all unless you have a solid, decent sized marketing team. I can tell you right now, I'm the chief marketing officer at TechBridge. We have a great and talented and amazing team. We are focused on two channels right now because even though I've got a great team that I'm building, I think there's, let's see, there's five of us. It's still not enough to focus on all the, the tons of channels. You got you to lock in on a channel that you can own and really do an amazing job on and own that. And then once you build it, once you build that audience, then you can expand to your next channel and, and, and you can conquer your next mountain, right? Conquer the Facebook mountain and then conquer the LinkedIn mountain and then conquer the Twitter mountain, you know? But don't try to conquer them all at the same time because that's a really good way to fall off the mountain. Yeah, that analogy really worked, didn't it? Okay, moving on. Choose a media type. So create the type of content your people love. Again, has to go back to what the people want, what your audience wants. It can't be the content you want to create. It has to be the content that they care about and how do they want to do it? Do they, are they big readers? Do they want white papers? Do they want blog posts? Are blog posts helpful to you? Maybe they're helpful for SEO, but maybe they're not helpful for social media. Do they want video? Do they want audio? Do they want podcasts? Like what do they want and how are they going to consume it the best? So you have to really understand all of that at a very, very deep level in order to choose the right media type for you and the type that's gonna really work well to meet your audience. All right, so now's the fun part. We gotta talk about a content calendar because if you don't have a content calendar, you don't have a plan. If you don't have a content calendar, you don't have a map, you don't have anything. You really just have some nice thoughts and some nice ideas. And so you gotta have a content calendar to help you map out what you're gonna do. So. You've got to map out the content that you will create and when. So the way, it, the, the best way to do that is, I mean, you can have a physical calendar. You can use a whiteboard. You can use Trello. Uh, my team, we use Asana. There's all kinds of different, different avenues and tools to do. But the bottom line is you got to know on this day, on Monday, we're going to have a draft of X. And on Tuesday, we're going to have the review of, of X. And on Wednesday, we're going to have the final approved. And on Thursday, we're going to, we're going to post it, right? So you've got to know when the schedule is and be willing to stick to it. It's incredibly, incredibly important because otherwise it becomes an initiative that you are passionate about for a week or two or maybe even a month. And then ultimately it falls off your radar because other pressing things come up and you forget. And then all of your social properties or hopefully your one or two social properties then become neglected. And then they're not helpful to you at all anymore. And then you've lost all your momentum and you've got to redo everything you just did. And that's no fun at all. So, so make sure you map it out, assign content to team members if you can. So ideally you'd have a team member that's creating content, a team member that's your editor, a team member that's then scheduling and posting that content. Consider using a schedule like Buffer or Hootsuite or I mean, any one of a number of different, different uh, publishers work really well for that, for scheduling out your posts, but make sure you've got assigned team members to really make, to take care of each step along the way, even if it's yourself. Make sure there are clear assignments so you know what you're doing. And then stay on track with creation and promotion. So you can't get so absorbed in creating content that you forget to promote your content, right? So you've got to be able to, uh, to create some content, promote some content, and then go forward from there. So um, I would recommend uh, this, this concept of pillar content. So this is a, a concept that I took. There was an article on medium.com. I'll see if I can dig up the link in a minute, uh, but it's an article on medium.com. And if you go to medium.com and you look up 100 in 100, um, there's a great article by a marketer on there. It's not my article. And he talks about basically uh, how to create a hundred pieces of content in a hundred days 
by using 10 pillar pieces of content. And so the idea of a pillar piece of content is one piece of content that you create, that you spend a decent amount of time um, well, creating uh, and building. And then all of the other content off of that for the next 10 days are then sort of derivatives of that. So a great example from what I'm, a project I'm working on right now is we did a, I did a deep interview with my CEO. So we have a relatively new CEO at TechBridge. She's amazing. She just came on board in January and a lot of the community hasn't gotten to know her yet. So I decided, you know, one of our pillar pieces of content is gonna be an interview with our CEO. So I, I took the time, I interviewed her, it's over Zoom. We just captured the video over Zoom, it's really easy. And just asked her like, tell me your story. Like, what, How did you get here? What did you do? What's the path that you took that was so interesting to prepare you for this role? And her path is just fascinating. And so then I said, okay, so now tell me what we're doing at TechBridge. What have you done so far? You know, in the last six months, what have you done? And then she, she walked me through that. And it's like, wait, so, and, and so now where are we gonna go? Like, where is the organization gonna go in the future? How are you gonna just take over the world with this organization, right? And then she cast this very broad vision uh, that was really fantastic. And, and what that allows me to do now is now I've got this one piece, this interview, this 30 minute amazing interview with this amazing person. And now I can cut that up into a whole bunch of different small segments and drip that out on social. And so I did one interview, it took you know 30 whole minutes. And now I can use iMovie, which is, you know, comes with the Mac and or, or any, there's a lot of other editing software out there that I'm happy to recommend. Um, but you can use other editing software and you can, you can cut it up into all kinds of different small portions. And so I could have a, a whole segment about what does TechBridge do? And I can have our CEO walking through the tenets of what we do because that was captured as a part of that interview. So you want to be thinking in, in terms of content creation and a content calendar, you want to map out what content you're going to create. And then you want to want to map out how you're going to create one piece of pillar content and how you're going to then cut that up to distribute it out along the way. And one piece of content can become 10 pieces of content or 20 or 30. I mean, the sky's the, I, I could use the interview, the video interview I did, and I could take a headshot of our CEO in one of the quotes from the thing. And I can, I can send that out as an, as a, uh, an image, you know I mean? I, I can create audio from it. I can create video from it. I can create images from it or infographics like, the, the sky is the limit. I can use canva.com. If you're not already using canva.com, that's a good place to start. I can use canva.com to create some amazing graphics for that. So, um, so I would strongly recommend that you think about that approach. It's really, really helpful. And then how to get started. So we kind of, we kind of framed up everything. Um, but how do you get started if you haven't really gotten into social media in depth? Um, like what's the best way to start that process, right? Um, so I, I kind of just listen three simple steps, listen and learn on your platform of choice. So get started, just dive in and absorb. Like what tone do people take? Is it, you know, LinkedIn is going to be more business professional. Facebook is going to be more friendly. Twitter is going to be, I don't know, more shouty in some ways, depending on who you follow. Right. But, but what tone do people take and who's effective on the platform and why? I mean, this is something that we often neglect when we start diving into social media, but take the time and, and like, what are, what are 10 accounts that are similar to what your nonprofit does that are just making a huge impact on that platform? Follow those accounts and learn what they're doing and see what you can implement from them. Get a feel for the personality of the platform before you jump in and post a bunch of stuff because you really need to engage in a way that is appropriate for that platform not in a way that's just appropriate for you or for another platform. Um, the next step is engage in conversation. So comment, like, reshare, become a deeper part of the community. This is the step that really I see almost every business missing and in particular nonprofits because we get so heads down in our own work and in doing good in our own ways that we forget that we, there's a broader conversation that we're a part of inside of social media. And we need to become a part, we need to become engaged in that conversation and have meaningful part in that conversation so that we can then begin to influence people and share and gain followers and, and gain influence of our own. And then number three, begin rolling out your content calendar as you learn and grow. Be ready to make tweaks along the way and roll out that content calendar so that uh, you can help a lot of people. So um, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap up and then I've got a content slide and then we're gonna, we're gonna dig into some Q&A. I have not been watching the Q&A uh, section yet, but I'm, gonna, I'm about to go to that screen. So if you haven't already typed in your question, go ahead and do that. Now's a good time. 
uh, please type it into the question and answer section, the Q&A section, not the chat, so that we can keep it nice and uniform. But I do want to stop, I do want to end with a nice uh, Albert Einstein quote, one of my favorites. If I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about solutions. I would say this is applicable to social media as well. Let's take the time to think about how we're going to approach it. Let's take the time to make a plan for how we're going to approach it. And only then begin to implement the solve for that problem uh, and move forward from there. So here's my contact information. I'm happy to, uh, to chat or to be of help in any way that I can. I'll leave that up on the screen. I think we're gonna also end up sharing, um, sharing this as well uh, down the road. So now let's, uh, let's go into our Q&A and I see there's some stuff in chat as well. Um, there's a, at least a couple of questions in Q&A, so we'll start there. Um, let's see, question number one. Can you speak about those digital platforms you mentioned for content calendars, Trello and Asana? Absolutely, yeah. So, so Trello is a free platform that is, is pretty fantastic, honestly. Um, it allows you to create um, kind of what looks like, um, like sticky notes that are in columns. And so you can do things like you can have a, a, a pillar or a, a column for pillar content and you have sticky notes for all your ideas. And then you can have a, a next pillar for like, you know, excerpts of that or whatever else. So it, it's a really interesting way to organize it. Very visual. Um, you can collaborate with teams and individuals on Trello um, all completely for free. It does a lot of stuff for free. It's fantastic. Um, Asana is more of a project management task list platform for teams. And so uh, it does great for content calendar, but it is a paid platform and it does uh, just so much more than just, uh, than just, you know, a content calendar. Like it's a great way to organize teams and projects and everything else. I mean, I run my entire team in Asana, every task, everything they need to do. It's all in Asana. It's pretty fantastic. So um, that's a really good one. Um, I mean, of course, you know, just Google docs can work too. I mean, you can use a Google spreadsheet, uh, a Google sheet pretty easily. I've done that lots of times with the content calendar that works well. Um, and then uh, there's also, uh, no, not smart sheets. Uh, there's another one that I'm sure I'll think, Airtable. Airtable actually is another interesting content calendar, um, but I believe that is also a paid service, but Airtable.com is worth, uh, worth considering. So, all right, let's see. Next question. What advice do you have for a nonprofit trying to use TikTok? We want to use it to engage younger audiences. <laughs> That's a good one. I love it. I love that you're thinking about this. Um, so, I, a couple of things. Um, TikTok is all about the hashtag game, first of all. So if you, if you don't understand how hashtags work on TikTok, um, you want to start there by researching that. Um, second is I would look at any brand that's doing a decent job on TikTok. A, a very quick Google search for brands on TikTok will, will render millions of articles for you on that. Um, so I would start there. Uh, there's a lot of different approaches and honestly, TikTok sort of it really shifts very quickly in terms of what's actively popular on the platform. And so I, I can't really give you a very prescriptive answer to that. Really all I can tell you is understand hashtags at a deep level and how to use them and make sure to follow some really solid companies that are doing good work. Um, and then, and then begin to, you know, potentially mimic what they're doing. Um, all right. Next question. Do you have any recommendations on strategy design templates and toolkits? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So um, I strongly recommend canva.com. Um, canva is a free tool. I believe you can even get pro for free um, as a nonprofit if you apply, um, which gives you access to like even more templates and everything else. The nice thing about Canva is that you can start with a template of a design and then you can change up the colors to meet your own color palette. And you can change up the, the topography or the fonts to meet your own brand guidelines um, and add in all your information. So for example, what I've done on Canva um, to kind of help us get started is I found a, a slide deck that was really great and fit our aesthetic and our needs. I took that, it was 24, 20, 28 slides. I took that, I converted it to be fully um, compatible with our brand standards. So I changed up the colors and the fonts and everything for that. And then I actually used that slide deck even for marketing materials. So when I need like a graphic to put on Facebook, for example, I'll go into that slide deck and I'll find a slide that's appropriate for the content that I want to put on Facebook. I'll resize that slide to the right size and then I'll create the graphic for Facebook for that. So that way the aesthetic of everything we produce is based off that original slide deck and makes everything a lot easier for me. So hopefully that's, that's helpful. If you have any more specific questions, happy to try to help further offline. 
Uh, let's see. Next question. My nonprofit has been posting on Facebook, Instagram, asking our audience to comment and it's been silent. How do we get them interested in the back and forth? Um, that's a great question. So I think you have to test. Um, one of my favorite things to do on social is to test wild ideas. So if you're posting things and you're not getting any traction at all, test something completely different. Um, if you're posting articles, don't post art, post a video if you're, or, or if, or post or go live or, um, I mean, basically think of the things that you could do on the platform that you have not done and, and even outlandish things and try those and see if you get engagement. And then if you don't, then move on to the next thing and test the next thing. But I mean, it, it's social media is always a try, fail, move on, try, succeed, increase. Like that's, that's the, that's the methodology at all times with social media. And really, and what you do today may not even be what you do a year from now either. It's, it's a constantly evolving, constantly learning process. What advice do you have about TikTok, anonymous attendee? Um, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Uh, I mean, TikTok is an interesting platform. It's really hard for brands, honestly. It's hard to do well. It's dominated by, uh, by teenagers. Um, teenagers are sort of notoriously hard to get in front of from a, a business perspective in general. Um, you know, there's a couple of different models you could take. Again, you could, you could look at companies out there that are doing well. You could also consider talking to influencers that already have big followings on TikTok and see if they're willing to stand behind your cause and support it. That's another possibility as well. Um, but it's, it's not an easy platform for brands like Facebook or Instagram or, or even LinkedIn. Uh, next question, is there a rule of thumb for what percentage of content should be original and what percentage should be shared or aggregated from other sources or pages? Oh, that's a really good question, Sam. Thank you. Um, so I, I don't know if there's necessarily a rule of thumb. I do think uh, that that article, the 100 and 100 article on Medium um, has been really, really helpful in framing my own thinking around that. Um, so the way that I look at it is I, I want to post something daily. Um, I want to have a pillar piece of content. Off of that pillar piece of content, I probably want to have three derivative pieces of content. So out of a 10-day stretch, that would be four days where we're posting original content. And the other six days um, actually would be either test content, like I just mentioned, doing some tests to see what works, or resharing other people's content, posts, or articles that are helpful to, um, to, the, to the audience, not to the organization. Um, so that's kind of how I look at it. So I would say, you know, roughly 40, 30, 40% original content, and then 60% can be sort of rehashed, repackaged, um, reshared, um, aggregated, however you want to want to look at it. That's at least my, my personal rule of thumb for that. Uh, next question. Do you have any time management techniques or tools for a person who's responsible for all aspects of content and marketing? Um, yeah, I've got a couple. Uh, so the first is I, I would do time blocking for sure. If you do not time block, you will never, ever, ever do it. Um, time blocking for anyone that doesn't know is the idea that you set an appointment with yourself on your calendar and that appointment is say the appointment's an hour long and it's write blog post, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and you treat that appointment as if it is a diehard appointment. You will not look at any communications, no messages, no nothing. You will sit during that one hour and you will type no matter what. If you feel like it or not, doesn't matter. Um, that's the first thing is I would absolutely time block um, those things. Um, I think, you know, the other thing is, is beginning to leverage uh, networks. So you might also think about like guest posting, for example, or guest content. So, I mean, a great example of guest content is what we're doing right now. Um, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I like talking about this stuff and I was fortunate to be invited to talk about this stuff and I like doing that and it doesn't cost uh, them anything and it doesn't cost me anything. It's a, it's a good partnership. So uh, you might consider guest content. It's a great way to look at it as well. Um, and then just think about following great um, profiles that produce a lot of good content that you can then reshare. And maybe if you're a single person that's trying to, to do all of it, Maybe your original content is more like 15 or 20% and, and the rest of it is reshared and that's okay. All right, so next question. How common is it for nonprofits to have a social media policy manual or guideline? Uh, I'm gonna go with incredibly uncommon, but probably very wise. Um, so I, I think it's kind of like having brand standards. Um, every company should and most don't or don't have good ones. I think that's true with social policy, social media policy and guidelines as well. Um, I mean, to me, the big things are 
you need to know the do's and don'ts of your social accounts. For example, um, what kind of tone are you going to take on social media? Is it okay to be sarcastic when you are responding to somebody on social media from your nonprofit's accounts? Is it okay to be funny? Um, is it okay to be academic? Um, you need to know these things. Like how, like what tone, what approach do you want to take as you are beginning to post? Is it okay to, to post using uh, insider jargon? By the way, um, I'm going to go with no. It's almost never okay to post using insider jargon. But that's just my own personal opinion. I don't like insider jargon and insider language. It, it excludes a lot of people and really limits your interactions on social. Um, so I would be careful about it, but, but is that okay? You know, I think having just a loose set of guidelines is probably a really, really smart idea. Oscar, that's a really good question. Thank you for asking. All right. How to next question, how to be nimble using a content calendar to changes that come up that cannot be ignored like George Floyd's death. Yes. That's a really, really good question. So two things. Um, number one, if you have something scheduled to post and and something significant in the culture happens, the first thing you do is look at everything scheduled and be sure that you're not gonna post something that's tone deaf. Um, that is absolute rule number one, immediately check what is scheduled. Um, number two becomes, the question becomes, do you then scrap what was previously scheduled and plan or do you supplement? Um, there are certain situations where you, you absolutely should scrap it because it's either gonna be lost, the white noise at that point or it's tone deaf to the current situation or um, maybe it's not, and it's a completely different area with a completely different audience, and you can just supplement and add in some commentary around what's happening socially. Um, but ultimately, you just have to be conscientious of those things because you do not ever want to be that brand that just sort of, um, well, again, is tone deaf. So I think we've, we've all seen examples of that, uh, and we, we don't, we don't want to do that. Uh, next question, what are the two channels you focus on at your company and why? Oh, that's a great question. So... Um, I'll give you the two channels and I'll give you the why and I'll, and I'll tell you why one of them might not be the right answer. Um, so we do focus on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn because we're a technology nonprofit and we work with a ton of chief information officers and chief information officers are more likely to be active on LinkedIn than they are to be active on like say Instagram, right? Um, so that's kind of the, the high level thing. Uh, Facebook because honestly, that's where we've got a lot of history. Um, that's where a lot of our supporters have started. Um, that's where a lot of our volunteers have been historically. Uh, that's the answer that's not necessarily the right answer. Um, just because we've been somewhere historically doesn't mean that that's where we should be. It's just where we are now. Um, so there will come a point where we have to reassess and determine, is this still the right channel for us or not? And if not, then what is? Um, for me personally, I think you've got, you've really got to look at what your audience is. Um, you know, demographic wise, um, you know, the Facebook does tend to skew a little bit older, Instagram skews a little, a little younger, TikTok, TikTok skews very young. Um, you know, LinkedIn is kind of a mixed bag and it's going to certainly be on the more professional side. So you just have to sort of know your audience and what's going to work best for you. Next question. What advice do you have regarding growing a following? Um, yeah, that's a good one. So I mean, leadership uh, is about influence, right? A leader is someone who has influence. Um, it's not someone who has power. It's not someone who has authority. It's not someone who's been sort of granted something. It's someone that has influence. And it's really the same thing for growing a following. It's somebody that has accumulated influence because of the value they add to the lives of people that follow them. So let me, let me say that again. It's someone that's accumulated influence because of the value they add to the lives of people that follow them. So whether that's entertainment, and you're following somebody because they make you laugh. Maybe you're following somebody because they're so outrageous that you just can't believe what they're gonna do next. Um, maybe you're following somebody because they're particularly thoughtful. I mean, Seth Godin is one of the most famous marketers in the world because he posts these just profoundly thoughtful things on a pretty regular basis. Um, you know, so maybe it's because you're thoughtful, um, but it's really just about providing value. Um, people follow leaders, people follow accounts, people follow organizations that bring value to their lives and affect change in their lives for a good. Um, so I think as long as you can do that, then you can gain a following, if that makes sense. Sorry, that was pretty broad and a non-answer too. I recognize that, but that's really the truth. Um, all right. Could you recommend schedulers, Hootsuite Buffer, that help collect good data across platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? Um, I wish I could, and if you know one, 
please email me. Uh, I, I honestly don't have a good one. They're really, in my mind, is, are, are not, a, not a lot of great tools out there for this. There's a couple. Social Sprout is pretty decent. Um, you're going to pay for that. It, it's, a, it's more of a pay to play sort of thing. I think, I mean, I know HubSpot even has some social tools as well. Um, but I, I don't know of one that really does a great job on the data side in particular, but would like to. Uh, all right. This next question is thank you. So thank you, Oscar. That was great. Uh, all right. We'll keep going. Let's see. What would you recommend for video creating for social media and organization website in terms of compatibility, uh, basic video platform recommendations when you have a minimal marketing staff? So Great question. So for video, um, and I'm going to look real fast on my phone. Uh, so if, if you're starting out and I had limited abilities and I needed to create some quick videos, I would look at, there's an app called Quick. I think it's, uh, I think it's Q-U-I-K um, or it's Q-I-K and it's by, um, it's by, uh, oh man, I forget the name of the company that, 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 uh, that created it. I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, um, it's a really easy on your phone video app, you can throw in it's by GoPro. Thank you, Stephanie. Quick by GoPro. Um, but you can throw in music, you can throw in transitions. It actually does a really amazing job. So I used to go out and be a part of these like community organization days. And I would just be on my phone and I would just kind of set up a few shots here and there. And I'd set up a tripod, do a time lapse, and all this other stuff. And then later that afternoon, um, I'd go home and it would take me maybe 15 minutes to create this just killer two minute video with tons of transitions and fast forwards and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, and I mean, it really looked amazing. And I could then post that directly from there onto YouTube, directly onto Facebook, onto anything I wanted to. Um, so, so I think that's a good starting point. Uh, GoPro also has a, a, a video app called Slice that's a little more advanced than Quick. If you wanna go that, go that route, that's a good option as well. iMovie's a good option. And as far as like platforms to be on, um, be on YouTube. I mean, honestly, uh, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. It's, I mean, people use it for virtually everything. It, create a YouTube channel, throw your videos on there, uh, create solid descriptions of what they're about, use keyword tags as best you can, and you'll gain some additional followers even without necessarily trying as you go through that process. So I think that's, that's really worth taking your time uh, to do that. All right, let's see. What do you think of paid posts and paid engagement? which social media and Instagram market a lot? Is it necessary as a part of a strategy? So uh, that's a really good question. I think a couple things about that. Number one, um, it, necessary is a strong word. It's helpful. Um, so a couple things that you, you can think about. Number one is um, on Facebook, one of, the, one of the more interesting ways you can promote yourself there is if you have a good newsletter list of people that follow you, you can load that newsletter list into Facebook and then you can actually run ads specifically only to people on that list that Facebook is able to match up, which is pretty great. Um, so for example, if you, have a people, if you have a list of people that get your newsletter, they obviously like you. And so if you're gonna run a volunteer campaign and you wanna run a paid campaign for that, they're gonna be more likely to sign up because they already know you if you run that to that list, for example, or same thing with donors. Um, you can also load in an email list and say to Facebook, hey, I wanna target people that look exactly like these people, but uh, are not these people, right? And Facebook, uh, to somewhat to my chagrin knows everything about me. And so they can be like, Hey, they find my email on the list and they go, Oh, you want people to look like Adam. So they got to be hat wearers and they have to have a million kids. Okay. Deal. And they'll find you some more hat wearers with a million kids that you can then advertise to. Um, so that's another really interesting way to do that. So I think, I think there's value in it. I would say related to paid engagement that you need to test, 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 test. Um, so start off with, you know, maybe a, maybe a smaller budget, maybe $200, maybe $500, but start off with a small budget and test and see, does it work? Did it get the outcome that you want? And then if it didn't, then try something different. And if it did, then you can also, you know, always take the time to put more money into it. So I think there's value there. If you've got the budget and time to invest into it, you just have to be very thoughtful about it. All right, next question. Is there a good Instagram analytics platform, preferably a free one? Um, I, I honestly do not know on that one. I have not been nearly as invested or involved in Instagram as I have in other platforms. So I know there, there, there's a lot of Instagram influencers out there that are diehard about their uh, analytics. So I would venture to say there probably is a platform, but I don't, I don't know what it is, unfortunately. I apologize. Uh, next question, maybe the last one, depending on if anybody else types anything in, intent. 
Um, we're going, or let's see, we're a small nonprofit with a small following, mostly other community agencies. How many posts per week is too many? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Most everybody asks, like, what's the least number of posts I can get away with per week? You're asking how many are too many. Um, a couple thoughts there. So number one, you have to post a lot to start to actually hit your same audience over and over because of the way the algorithms work. So the reality is you could probably post two to three times a day and you're still probably gonna hit diverse audiences across depending on how big your audience is. So, um, I, you know, I think you can go to one to three times a day pretty fine and, 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 and see how it goes. And really that's the key is see how it goes. So I think you've got to test it. So, I mean, what is it, what happens? If you take a week and you post three times a day, what happens? If you take a week and you post once a day, what happens? If you take a week and you don't post, what happens, right? So, I mean, I think that's the way you have to think about social media is what can you test and really like experiment with and see what effect it has. And then when it works, what can you ramp up? So that's, that's what I would consider doing. All right, let's see. Are there any other questions that you'd like to add to the Q&A? Anybody? See, there's a lot, of, a lot of chat happening in the chat window, which is great. I'm, I'm happy to see that. Any other questions yeah, for me? There's been some, a couple questions in the chat too. I don't know if you wanted to go over those oh. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see any, any specific that I should look at? Um, just referring back to, you know, the two channels that you were talking about, the, the channels that you focused on at TechBridge, um, how do you tailor your content to reach both audiences? Oh, yeah, that's a good question, right? Um, yeah, because the Facebook audience is different from the LinkedIn audience, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think uh, a couple things. Number one, um, I find hashtags are a little bit more valuable on LinkedIn than they are on Facebook. Yeah, so that's something to consider. Um, on LinkedIn, I find that audiences are a little more willing to read and, uh, and participate in deeper levels of content than they are on Facebook. Facebook's like a little more of like, like let's just skim through all of it um, versus LinkedIn that's really kind of more like you can sort of dive down deep into it. Um, so I think that's kind of one way to look at it and that's one way that we look at it as well. Um, so I think you've just got to know like what the audience is like. Um, are they willing to read a 2000 word article? Um, I would say Facebook typically absolutely not. Um, LinkedIn, surprisingly, yes. Um, so you just have to sort of know that audience, but that's kind of how we look at it. Um, oh, a couple, another couple of questions. Um, let's see. Is it okay to cross post the same post from Facebook to Instagram without changing the look? Um, I, again, I would go to experiment with that. I think, you know, starting out, sure, right? Um, see how it goes. See what kind of engagement you get on Facebook versus um, Instagram. And, and, you know, is there a huge difference? And then what happens if you do take a photo and you doctor it one way for one and one for another, like where, do you, where does it change? And, and then if, if, it, if you do get more engagement, then you begin, have to begin asking yourself, is it worth taking that extra time or not? Um, because it's all, a, it's all a risk reward, right? If, you if I take the time to take this photo and doctor it one way and put this approach versus another one, like, you know, is, is it worth it? Does it pay off? Um, all right, next one. Uh, should content be specifically, oh, a similar one. So should content be specifically tailored to each platform or should it be consistent? So I, ideally you would, you would take the time to tailor content. Um, I mean, that's really always your best bet is to try to tailor content as best you can to that platform, to that audience, to those people, because they are different. The reality though, is that a lot of times we just don't have that kind of time or that margin. And so in those cases, you just have to make the best judgment call that you can and move forward. Uh, any other questions? Another interesting question that was in the chat, um, advice for social media strategy in regards to organizations for seniors. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah. And I'm very curious. For, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I really think the question becomes on that one, um, who, who, like, who's your real audience? It would really be my question. So I'm so interestingly, mm -hmm. I had a, um, I had a client, so I ran a, I ran a digital marketing agency for 10 years um, before we were acquired. And then I, I sort of moved into this nonprofit space that I, and I, I've done nonprofits too, but that's a whole other story. Um, but I had a client and they were um, actually one of the oldest nonprofit, um, I think they called them elder care facilities in Atlanta. And we had to kind of walk through like, what is the audience here? Like, is the audience really the older adult that we're trying to place in this facility or is the audience really that adult's children or grandchildren? Um, and the answer is it's, it's a little bit of all of them, but 
there's there's certainly a majority where it's really more the children and grandchildren, right? Um, and so we sort of we we had to begin to to tailor our content recognizing that. So I think what you do is you recognize that yes, there are definitely some some older adults that will read this and they need to appreciate the approach that we take. But with that said, it's probably their children or their even their grandchildren that are the actual target audience for that. If that makes sense. Yeah, that totally makes sense. All right. Well, I think you have won for the Guinness World Records of most questions answered. I think that was about 20 questions. Um, so that brings us to pretty much time. So that's great. Thank you so much, Adam. That so many people have already said how helpful um, the presentation has been. So again, thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to try to share my screen for the last um, slide to sign off. Um, go. All right. Well, I hope that was super helpful, helpful for you all today. Uh, before we do sign off, I just wanted to remind you that our next webinar will be on Thursday, July 30th at 9 a.m. PST, which is also 12 p.m. EST. Uh, the session will be led by Lydia Varesco, who is the founder of Lydia, Lydia Varesco Design, where she'll be presenting her webinar titled Social Media Marketing 101 for Nonprofits. And if you haven't signed up for that, uh, we've just posted it in the, um, the chat box there um, for you to sign up. And once more, uh, by attending this session, you're eligible to receive one CFRE credit. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me. Um, that's melissa.bilko at keela.com to learn more on how to receive those. And lastly, I just wanted to remind everyone that Adam's session was recorded today and you'll receive that along with his slide deck by the end of this week. Um, that is it for us today. Adam, I don't know if you had any final words before we sign off here. Um, uh, no, yeah, just say thanks so much for coming. And uh, if I can be of service, uh, you've got my website, you've got my email. So happy to be, um, but thanks for signing up and joining in. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.